What does the Holy Spirit do during the dispensation of grace? What does the Holy Spirit do during the dispensation of grace? When people think of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, they often think of things like healing, tongues, miracles, things like that. The Holy Spirit isn't doing those things today. So people then often ask the question, well, if the Holy Spirit isn't doing those things, then what exactly is the Holy Spirit doing during the dispensation of grace? This study is going to focus on answering that question. There are two sections. The first section will be things that the Holy Spirit did at the beginning of the dispensation of grace. And then the second section will be 30 things that the Holy Spirit continues to do today. So let's start with section one, things that the Holy Spirit did at the beginning of the dispensation of grace. So get Romans chapter one, verse four. The first thing that the Holy Spirit did at the beginning of the dispensation of grace, and to be precise, it's before the dispensation of grace, is raised Christ from the dead. Get Romans chapter one, verse four. And declared to be the Son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. In other words, the spirit of holiness raised Christ from the dead. Look at Romans 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Now, obviously, the raising up of Christ from the dead is something that occurred before the dispensation of grace occurred, but I wanted to include that because it's something that Paul mentions in his epistles that the Holy Spirit did. The second thing that the Holy Spirit did at the beginning of the dispensation of grace is the Holy Spirit empowered Paul's ministry. Romans chapter 15, verse 19. Romans chapter 15 and verse 19. Through mighty signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and round about unto Illyricum, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. The Holy Spirit empowered Paul's ministry. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 4. 2 Corinthians 6, 4. But in all things, approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. Paul did those things in his ministry. It says there, by the Holy Ghost. So what happened with Paul's ministry at the beginning of the dispensation of grace is the Holy Spirit gave Paul special empowerment to perform the ministry that God desired to be performed. The third thing, the Holy Spirit gave spiritual gifts to the body of Christ. Get 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. 1 Corinthians 12, 4. Now there are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. Verse 7. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit withal. Verse 8. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Verse 11. But all these worketh that one and the self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. The body of Christ at the beginning of the dispensation of grace was given spiritual gifts, and they were given by the Holy Spirit. Now that's not something that is still continuing today. Look with me at 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, 
but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. So what are we seeing here? During the beginning of the dispensation of grace, the Holy Spirit did a number of extraordinary things that it's not doing today. One of those is it empowered Paul's ministry. It, it enabled Paul to perform the ministry that the Lord Jesus Christ gave him. Paul talks about having the signs of an apostle. Well, how did Paul perform the signs of an apostle? By his own personal strength? No, it was the Holy Spirit empowering him to do that. And not only did the Holy Spirit empower Paul for his ministry, but the Holy Spirit gave spiritual gifts to the body of Christ. Those spiritual gifts were given for a period of time, but they ceased. 1 Corinthians 13 tells us that those gifts cease. So as we think about what the Holy Spirit does during the dispensation of grace, the first thing to notice is at the beginning of the dispensation of grace, the Holy Spirit enables some extraordinary powers to accomplish what God wanted to jumpstart, to, to edify the body of Christ at that time. We're going to spend the rest of our time now looking at section two, and we're going to look at things that the Holy Spirit both did then and continues to do even today. And there are 30 different things that we're going to look at, so it's quite a few. So let's jump in. The first is the Holy Spirit justifies the believer. 1 Corinthians 6, verse 11. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. You are justified, you are declared righteous by the Holy Spirit. 1 Timothy 3.16, 1 Timothy 3.16, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the Spirit. Well, that's how believers get justified today. It's by the, the work of the Holy Spirit. Number two, the Holy Spirit is received by the believer at salvation. Get Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. Galatians chapter 3, verse 2. This only would I learn of you. Received ye the Spirit by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, are ye now made perfect by the flesh? Well, what those verses are teaching is you receive the Spirit by the hearing of faith. In other words, when you believe the gospel, you hear the gospel and you believe it, you receive the Holy Spirit at that time. You're in Galatians 3, look at verse 14. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Yet 1 Timothy 4, verse 8. 1 Timothy 4, verse 8. He therefore that despiseth despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. One of the wonderful things of many things that happens to you at salvation is you receive the Holy Spirit. Number three, the Holy Spirit gives the believer a spiritual birth and spiritual life. Get Galatians 4.29. Galatians 4.29 but as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Do believers during the dispensation of grace have a spiritual birth? They do according to Galatians 4.29. They're born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Get Romans 8 verse 2. Romans chapter 8 and verse 2. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Notice verse 10. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. In other words, if you have the Spirit within you, the Spirit gives you life. You had to have a spiritual birth because prior to believing the gospel, you were spiritually dead. 
That's just how it works. You are spiritually dead because of your sins, because of your guilt. When you believe the gospel, by the hearing of faith, you receive the Spirit, and you were given a spiritual life, and you received a spiritual birth. Number four, the Holy Spirit baptizes the believer into the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. When you believe the gospel, the Holy Spirit baptizes you. He, he places you into the body of Christ. Number five, the Holy Spirit creates unity in the body of Christ. Get Ephesians 4, verse 3. One of the things that people often observe and remark is that there is very little unity in the body of Christ. And that is a true statement. Look at Ephesians 4, verse 3. Endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Well, the reason there's not more unity in the body of Christ, it's not the Holy Spirit's fault. If every member of the body of Christ was walking in the Spirit, there would be unity in the body of Christ. The problem is that most members of the body of Christ don't walk in the Spirit. And because they don't walk in the Spirit, there is a lack of unity in the body of Christ. But it's not the Holy Spirit's fault, it's man's fault. Number six, the Holy Spirit seals the believer. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. 2 Corinthians 1, 22, Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts? Get Ephesians 1, 13. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Get Ephesians 4, verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. So what happens with the believer is after we believe the gospel, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit, and we are sealed unto the day of redemption. Hallelujah. That, that means you can't lose your salvation. Your salvation is not maintained by your good works. You've been sealed by the Holy Spirit all the way up until the day of redemption. Now, I want to make one observation about the seal, and that is this. If you look up the, the definition of the word seal, one of the definitions is it's a device, a heraldic or emblematic design, a letter, word, or sentence impressed on a piece of wax or other plastic material, adhering or attached by cords or parchment slips to a document as evidence of authenticity or attestation. In other words, the seal is the wax that's placed on the document, but notice that it has a design, a letter, a word, or a sentence. There is something about a seal that is distinctive. In other words, think of it this way. Did the king of England and the king of France and the king of Sweden, did they all use the same seal and it looked exactly the same? Well, they wouldn't have done that. It would have been, it would have been contrary to the purpose to do that. The, the purpose of the seal is to provide identification. So it has to be distinct and it must have content to it. With that in mind, what do you think is the distinctive content? of the seal of the Holy Spirit. Get with me 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. 2 Timothy 2, 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. And here's what it is. Look at it. Seal, comma, capital T, the. I think this is the content of the seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and capital L, let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now think about this just for a minute. 
as you think about the book of Revelation, are there some during the tribulation that uh, there are 144,000 that are sealed to accomplish God's purposes? Sure there are. And there are those that are unbelievers who take the mark of the beast. And what happens is it's an identification mark that identifies them as belonging to Satan. Well, there's something that happens to you as a member of the body of Christ. You're sealed, and as best I can tell what that seal is, what the content of that seal is, you're sealed with a mark, and it says this, The Lord knoweth them that are his. Who do you belong to? You're one of the Lord's. He knows who you are, and he knows that you are his. And there's a second part to the mark. What does it say? Let everyone that nameth the name of the Christ depart from iniquity. And that's, of course, how we should think about our lives. So that brings us to number seven. The Holy Spirit sanctifies the believer. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Get Romans 15, verse 16. Romans 15 and verse 16. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. What this seventh function of the Holy Spirit is, is the believer is sanctified, in other words, set apart to God's purposes. In, in other words, think of it this way. Did God save you so you could keep living the way that you're living? Well, that would, no, he didn't do that. We are God's workmanship, created unto, unto Christ Jesus, created unto, good, created unto good works. Think about the content of the seal again. Let me just read it to you. The seal in 2 Timothy 2.19 is, The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Well, you're set apart for what reason? To depart from iniquity and to walk in the Spirit and to perform good works. Number eight, the Holy Spirit serves as an earnest or first fruits. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. The Holy Spirit is given unto us as an earnest, as a down payment, as, as, as a good faith sign of what God is ultimately going to perform. If we look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 5, Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. You recall earlier we looked at Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14, where the Holy Spirit is described as an earnest. Let's get Romans 8 verse 23. Romans chapter 8 and verse 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. The Holy Spirit is described as an earnest. It's described as first fruits because what a wonderful message. Here is the first taste. Here is the first installment of the many wonderful things that I'm going to do for you. You can be confident that God is going to fulfill every promise he has made to the body of Christ because he's given the Holy Spirit to you as an earnest, as a guarantee, as the first fruits of what is yet to come. Number nine, the Holy Spirit dwells in the believer. Get Romans chapter 8 and verse 
9. Romans 8, 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Verse 11. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. Yet 1 Corinthians 3.16. 1 Corinthians 3.16. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Each individual believer is a temple of God, because a temple is where God dwells, and God dwells in you, because the Spirit of God dwells in you. 2 Timothy 1, verse 14. 2 Timothy 1, 14. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Now what you're seeing is there's a ton of verses here, aren't there? And that's why I'm moving quickly. But there are a just, a, there's an incredible number of verses as to what the Holy Spirit is doing today. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? Ephesians 2, 22. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 22 in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. You're, if you're a habitation of God, it means that God dwells within you. Number 10, the Holy Spirit leads the believer out from the Old Testament law and into liberty. Galatians 5, verse 1. Galatians 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So where's to stand fast in liberty? Look at verse 18. You're still in Galatians 5. Look at verse 18. But if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. As a lost person, you were under the law, and you were under... The, what's called the yoke of bondage. But if you're saved, the Spirit has now led you into the liberty that you have in Christ. Look with me at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. It's a blessed thing not to be under the bondage of the Old Testament law. 2 Corinthians 3, 17. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Number 11, the Holy Spirit provides the believer access unto God the Father. Get Ephesians 2.18. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 18. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Think about that. The Holy Spirit gives us access unto the Father. There are verses in the Scripture that say that God will not hear the prayers of the wicked. Well, guess what? There's a wonderful thing that happened to you. When you believed the gospel, you were justified by the Holy Spirit. You were declared righteous, and you were given access by the Spirit unto God the Father. Item 12, the Holy Spirit makes the believer a son of God. Romans chapter 8, verse 12. 14. Romans 8, 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Well, if you're a believer, you're led by the Spirit, and therefore you are made a son of God. Number 13. The Holy Spirit bears witness that we are the children of God. Get Romans 8, 15. Romans 8, 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Now in point number 12, the Holy Spirit makes the believer a son of God. But are there ever times where you don't feel that way? 
or you may feel distant or estranged because of your emotions. Well, what the Holy Spirit does is it bears witness. It testifies to us that we are the children of God. Look at verse 16, Romans 8, 16. The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Not only did the Holy Spirit make you a son of God, what the Holy Spirit does is it bears witness. It reminds you that you are a child of God. Galatians 4, verse 6. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. The term Abba is a term of affection. It's the equivalent of daddy. It's not formal, it's close. What the Holy Spirit does is it gives us a close, personal, intimate relationship with God the Father such that we can cry, Abba, Father. Number 14, the Holy Spirit fellowships with the believer. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 1. If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies. Well, apparently there's a fellowship of the Spirit. Look with me at 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. 2 Corinthians 13, verse 14. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, notice this, and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. You have the ability to commune, to fellowship with the Holy Ghost. Number 15, the Holy Spirit shows the believer God's love. Romans 5, verse 5. Romans chapter 5, verse 5. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. The idea there of the love of God being shed abroad in our hearts is it's, it's poured out. It's bestowed upon us by the Holy Ghost. Look with me at Romans 15, verse 30. Romans 15, verse 30. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit, that ye strive together with me in your prayers to God for me. We're talking again about the love of the Spirit. Now let me just pause here and make a point before we keep going. People sometimes have the idea, well, the Holy Spirit is kind of quiet today. He doesn't do a whole lot because we don't see actual speaking in tongues and we don't see miracles and we don't see the sign gifts and we don't see all of these sort of dramatic visual things that took place at the beginning of the dispensation of grace. But if you look at the things we're looking at, these are not small things. These are not trivial things. These are profound things that should affect your spiritual life. I realize that may, they may not be like visually sensational. I, I, I get that. But are they spiritually significant? And they, they clearly are. So let's resume with number 16. The Holy Spirit enables believers to love others. Colossians 1 verse 8. Colossians chapter 1 verse 8. Who also declared unto us your love, notice, in the Spirit. Get 2 Corinthians 3 verse 2. If I had to love my fellow man with just what's in my flesh, I would be really terrible at doing that. I would be completely useless. But if the Holy Spirit that indwells me, energizes me, equips me to love others, then that's really something, isn't it? The Holy Spirit is effective in that regard. 2 Corinthians 3 verse 2, Ye are our epistle 
written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. You can see there that the epistle of Christ that's written, it's not with ink, but it's the Spirit of God in fleshly tables of the heart. Item 17. The Holy Spirit speaks through the Word of God. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, so the Spirit was speaking something, that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. What's going on there is the Spirit was expressly stating that, and what God did is he recorded that fact in 1 Timothy so we, should, we would have it. In other words, the Spirit made that express statement and then recorded it in the Scriptures so that we would know it. Item 18, the Holy Spirit reveals spiritual truth. Have you ever wondered why there are people in the world that are worldly brilliant, extremely intelligent, very capable, very knowledgeable, and yet they seem to lack all spiritual understanding? Why is that? It's because the Holy Spirit reveals spiritual truth, and if the Holy Spirit doesn't reveal it to you, you will not know it. Ephesians 3, verse 5. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 5. Which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that reveals spiritual truth to man. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 10. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. It's the Spirit of God that allows us to know the things that are freely given to us of God. Look at verse 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. Doesn't matter how smart you are. Doesn't matter how many degrees you have. Doesn't matter your IQ. The natural man cannot receive the spiritual things of God. Why? For they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Without the Spirit of God, man has no capability to discern and understand spiritual truth. Yet 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 3. Wherefore, I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. The idea of what's going on in that verse is sometimes people like to mock that verse, and an unbeliever will say, Jesus is the Lord, Jesus is the Lord. And the Bible says, I can't do that unless I have the Holy Ghost. Well, that's not what the verse is saying. What's talking about there is no man can say Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost, is no one can come to sincerely believe that without the Holy Ghost revealing it unto them. If it weren't for the Holy Spirit, there's no spiritual truth that we would know. Number 19, the Holy Spirit bears witness to the truth. So in, in number 18 was the Holy Spirit reveals spiritual truth. Now it also bears witness. Romans chapter 9, verse 1. Romans chapter 9, verse 1. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also 
in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. In other words, the Holy Spirit there, it gave assurance, it gave testimony to the truth. Item 20, the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God as a sword. Get Ephesians 6.17. Ephesians 6.17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit. So the Spirit has a sword, it has an instrument, it has a weapon that it can use to accomplish its purpose. What is the weapon that the Holy Spirit uses? It's the Word of God. Item 21, the Holy Spirit fills the believer. Ephesians 5.18, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Holy Spirit fills the believer. Item 22, the Holy Spirit strengthens the believer. Ephesians 3.16. Ephesians chapter 3.16. That he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might by his Spirit in the inner man. If you ever feel weak, if you ever feel frail, what's the answer? Well, it's the Holy Spirit that strengthens you in the inner man. Get Philippians chapter 1, verse 19. Philippians 1, 19. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Our spiritual life is designed to function on the energy of the Holy Spirit. What do I mean by that? I have a car. If I don't put any fuel in the car, it won't go anywhere. It needs the fuel. It needs to be able to have power to go anywhere. Well, how does your spiritual life operate? You're strengthened by the Holy Spirit, meaning if you feel weak, you're not allowing the Holy Spirit to empower your life. Point 23, the Holy Spirit enables the believer's walk. Get Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. See, even as a saved person, you can decide how you want to walk. There are saved people that choose to walk after the flesh. Now, they do that to their own shame, to their own hurt. They had not to do it. What we ought to do is we ought to walk after the Spirit. Look at verse 4. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Well, how do you do that? Verse 5. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. The Spirit enables the believer's walk. And what we need to do is we need to choose in our minds, I need to mind the things of the Spirit. I need to be thinking about the things of the Spirit rather than thinking about the things of the flesh. Titus 3, verse 5. Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost renews our mind. Get Galatians 5, verse 16. Galatians 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So what do you need to do if you want to stop fulfilling the lust of the flesh? You have to walk in the Spirit. Look at verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, that's because the Spirit has given us life. What should we do? Let us also walk in the Spirit. Item 24, the Holy Spirit lusts against the flesh. What does that mean? Well, get Galatians 5, verse 17. Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit 
against the flesh. You get the sense that they are at odds with one another, don't you? And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Yet Ephesians 4, verse 30. What happens in your life is the Holy Spirit and the flesh are in conflict with one another as to how your life should be run. And we need to make the decision to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 4.30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let me explain what's going on there. You're sealed by the Holy Spirit unto the day of redemption. The Holy Spirit indwells you. We just saw that the Spirit lusts against the flesh and the flesh against the Spirit. So guess what happens? What happens when you as a believer walk according to the flesh? Well, the Holy Spirit remains within us, but the Holy Spirit is grieved because the Spirit lusteth against the flesh and the flesh lusteth against the Spirit. Let me put it this way. How many sins does the Holy Spirit commit? And the answer is zero. So when the Holy Spirit indwells a believer and the believer walks in sin, the Holy Spirit is constantly frustrated, annoyed, vexed, and grieved because the Holy Spirit is inside the believer that's doing this. That's why the command is, and grieve not the Holy Spirit. In other words, we have all been blessed with the indwelling Holy Spirit. It provides all of these blessings that we've been looking at. We ought to not grieve him. We ought to not drive him crazy by our continual walking after the flesh. 1 Thessalonians 5.19 1 Thessalonians 5.19 Quench not the Spirit. It's the same idea of grieving not the Spirit. The Holy Spirit lusts against the flesh, and every time we walk in the flesh, we grieve, we quench the Holy Spirit. Get Romans 8, 13. Romans chapter 8, 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. When it says, therefore, if you live after the flesh, you shall die, it doesn't mean that you'll lose your salvation. But if you live after the flesh, you will sow destruction in your life. It's, it's, it's unavoidable. But if instead, if what we do is through the Spirit, we do mortify the deeds of the body, we will have spiritual life as a result of that. That brings us to item 25. The Holy Spirit produces fruit in the believer's life. Get Galatians 5.22. The Holy Spirit will produce fruit in our lives if we will let it. Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Get Ephesians 5.9. Ephesians 5.9, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness and righteousness and truth. Romans 14.17, Romans 14, 17, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 6. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Even when they were in affliction, could the Holy Ghost produce joy in their lives? Yes, it could. Romans 15, 13. Romans 15, 13. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that ye may abound in hope. How? Through the power of the Holy Ghost. Yet Galatians 6, verse 7. What you've seen from all those verses is the Holy Spirit will produce fruit in our lives. Galatians 6, verse 7. Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption, but he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. Let's go on to the next item, number 26. The Spirit changes the believer into the image of the glory of the Lord. 2 Corinthians 3.18 2 Corinthians 3.18 but we all with open face beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image 
from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Holy Spirit changes us from our tarnished image unto the image of the glory of the Lord. Item 27, the Spirit enables the believer's prayer life. Ephesians 6.18. Ephesians 6.18. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit. Yet Romans 8.26 the next item is item 28. The Holy Spirit intercedes on the believer's behalf. Romans 8:26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. I want to pause there just for a minute. The Spirit helps our infirmities, according to that verse, and the Spirit maketh intercession for us. So think about that just for a minute. We're saved, we're justified, we're declared righteous, we're indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and what the Holy Spirit does on our behalf is it intercedes on our behalf with God the Father. Isn't that glorious? Even while we fail God in so many ways, the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. Look at verse 27. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Now, just get with me Romans 2.18 for a minute. Romans 2.18 and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. So verse 18 is talking about the Son of God. Read verse 23. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give ev unto every one of you according to your works. What Revelation 2 says is that it is Jesus Christ that searches the hearts. So when you think about Romans 8.26, Romans 8.26 says, The Spirit maketh intercession. And then Romans 8.27 says, And he that searches the hearts, that's Jesus Christ, knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. You have both the Holy Spirit, and God the Son interceding on behalf of the believer with God the Father. Two members of the Godhead are interceding on your behalf with God the Father. We're almost done. Point 29, the Holy Spirit enables the believer to wait for the catching. Get Galatians 5.5. 5. Do you ever at times think, I wish the rapture would happen, I'm, I'm ready to leave, I'm, I'm about done with this earth? Galatians 5.5, 5, For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. That's a reference to the, the hope, the believer's blessed hope that we receive at the end of the dispensation of grace. The Holy Spirit enables us, it equips us to wait for the catching up. And then number 30, the last one, this seemed like a good one to conclude with. The Holy Spirit quickens the believer's mortal body. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Romans chapter 8 and verse 11. But if the Spirit that raised up Jesus from the dwed, dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. The Holy Spirit is going to quicken our mortal bodies. So let me tie this all together. I realize we've covered numerous verses. We've covered 30 different things the Holy Spirit is doing today. What is the point of all this? And by the way, there are things we didn't cover, so there's more that the Holy Spirit does. What I want you to notice is this. People sometimes think the Holy Spirit isn't allowing people to speak in tongues. 
the Holy Spirit isn't allow people to do miracles. And so the Holy Spirit today, he's just kind of quiet. He's not doing much. He's, he's sort of passive. That's just completely and utterly wrong. The Holy Spirit is doing a ton of different things on our behalf. The problem is we're not going to know what those things are unless we get into this book and we read verse after verse and we study what the Holy Spirit is doing. What's actually going on today is there's a ton of things that the Holy Spirit is doing for us and we just need to get into the Word of God and understand what they are. So let me leave you with this encouragement. I gave you a list of a bunch of things, but there's more. What you ought to do is you can read Paul's epistles for yourself. You can look at every verse where the Holy Spirit is mentioned or the Holy Ghost is mentioned, and you can make your own list of everything that the Holy Spirit is doing today. Praise God for his great love for us.